We are delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's panel discussion held in conjunction with our exhibition, Era Mahade. Uh, we're delighted to have with us four of the writers who contributed essays to the exhibition catalogue. We have with us Michael Vatikiotis, who is a former editor and correspondent with the Far Eastern Economic Review and was the KL Bureau Chief in the 90s. We have Cathy Rowland, who's a writer and editor and art advocate. Hafiz Noor Shams, an economist who writes for the Financial Times. And Jahaba Sadiq, a journalist and former editor of the Malaysian Insider. If we could give them a, a welcome. We also especially delighted that we have with us Sharad Kutan, who is a journalist and a producer with BFM Radio. And Sharad will be moderating the session for us. Uh, before I pass this over to Sharad, just to remind everyone to please put your phones on silent and also to let you know that we are recording this session for documentation purposes. Thank you. Over to you, Sharad. Thank you, Rahel. Uh, it's a, a great delight to be here. Uh, the, when this uh, space opened up, uh, uh, was it a year ago now? Uh, the, the first exhibition they had was an extraordinary display of Bate and its, uh, you know, its various expressions. Uh, the Mahate exhibition that follows it is, is so different in, the, in what it's trying to do. And in some ways, you know, I've come to see this exhibition and every time uh, I think about it, I'm not entirely sure how, quite how to process all the images and objects that are here in terms of the, the, the really difficult um, thing we call Dr. Mahathir. I mean, I call him a thing, uh, not to dis, uh, disparage him in any way, because <clears throat> he's clearly many things. A man, a politician, uh, a shadow, a specter, uh, a living legacy. You know, he's, he's still making headlines today. Uh, and that complexity, that, uh, that's, that vast span uh, uh, that he's cast over, and shadow that he's cast over this nation, uh, makes him uh, an object of great intrigue, I think, for any journalist, uh, art historian, or economist, or you know, somebody with a kind of global view of what is happening in the region. So we have, uh, in our view, a very complex object. And I think uh, the, the four individuals here, are, it's notable that there's only one person who's really in, from the arts, as it were, somebody who's, who's been documenting and looking at both performing arts as well as you know, other forms of art um, in a space that's devoted to the art. But who we have here are political journalists, two political journalists, one economist. Uh, and that says something about the, the man's legacy. So I, without, I'm going to talk for too long. I'm, we've asked each of the speakers to maybe make an intervention of about five to seven minutes. And then uh, we'll have a discussion, draw you in the audience into it as soon as we can to, to get your ideas. Clearly, you know, you are uh, not people just who've walked off the street. You've made the effort to come to Ilham on a Saturday afternoon. It must mean you have some burning questions of, of perspectives of your own, and I'm going to help you uh, surface those uh, during the next hour and a half. So I'm going to ask the most senior member of the lineup, and I know everybody's looking away from me because they don't want to be identified the most senior, but you know who you are, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Michael was in Kuala Lumpur as Bureau Chief for the Far Eastern Economic Review from 1991-94. Uh, and if you're old enough to remember what the Far Eastern Economic Review represented for the chattering classes of Asia, you know it was, uh, in many ways, uh, one, a significant and important uh, uh, vehicle for the continual description and challenge for what was happening uh, on, on, in the economy, in, in society, in, in terms of culture. And so I'm going to call upon Michael to begin uh, this difficult discussion. Michael. Thank you, Shard. Um, Wartawan, senor, as I'm called. Um, I want to begin with a very personal reflection, which in many ways is about, says more about my own introduction to Malaysia uh, and, and how I came to know it. Um, but also obviously involves Dr. Mahathir. I first met Dr. Mahathir Mohammed in Indonesia before I came to Malaysia. And it was an extraordinary um, 
event that I witnessed. Um, it was a bit like sort of, uh, you know, here was a great strong leader of a country who had arrived in a country that was a bit like, um, what is that thing with Superman when he doesn't have the Krypton, you know? Um, he, he was at a very weak moment because President Suharto had invited him to Jogjakarta, which is the heart of Javanese culture, which Mahathir never really understood or liked, as far as I can see. Um, and he decided the two men didn't get on very well. And so in order to weaken Mahathir even further, um, he invited him to the heart of the Javanese Kraton and you know, all the sort of pomp and ceremony of the Javanese culture. And there was this man in a safari suit who looked totally bewildered and uncomfortable and, you know, what are these clashing symbols and gongs about, you know, and just get me out of here. Um, and that was my first encounter with Marty. It was a very deliberate, um, on the part of Suharto, a very deliberate put down uh, of a man he didn't really particularly like, uh, but had to deal with. Um, but it also demonstrated to me this incredible clash of cultures between Indonesia and Malaysia that I came to know as soon as I got here. Um, it was complicated for me because I had learned my Malay in Indonesia and not here, and uh, you know, there are all sorts of um, neur neuroses and insecurities about that. Um, on, you know, it, 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 it cuts both ways. Um, but that was my first meeting with Martyr, and I think it was the only time I ever saw him vulnerable. Michael, before you, uh, I, we hand over to, to Kathy, because I'm going to call upon Kathy next. What were the major themes, uh, at least in terms of reporting, that uh, you presided over from a 91 to 94? I mean, it was, it was a heady years, uh, you know, uh, deep in the kind of boom years of the Mahate period. Uh, before you know the later part of that decade when we hit the Asian financial crisis. So what was it that you were reporting on? Did you ever in fact interview him during that period? No, he didn't give many interviews to the foreign media and especially to the Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, but um, we, it, it was also one of the very few ASEAN leaders that I knew who, had, who even though he never gave many interviews, he was incredibly open and accessible. Um, because you would turn up at the um, no Supreme Council meetings or at the Parliament and you could doorstep the man. Um, and so you were always in a kind of constant partial conversation with him um, as you walked down a corridor or something, um, a corridor of power. Um, so the major theme for, for my period, I think, um, was, was essentially when he started to, uh, and, I, and this is what I wrote about in the catalogue, when he started to articulate an extremely um, uh, aggressive posture on the world stage. Uh, well, aggressive maybe is the wrong word. Um, um, a rather a bold posture. Um, he saw himself as a leader of the third world. Um, he saw himself as a man who, who could sort of poke the eye of the West. Um, you know, there were a number of very famous stories at the time about things he said. Not, ne not necessarily things that he did, but things that he said that generated a great deal of controversy. Um, and were very effective because in many ways he never harmed the country's interests uh, with the things that he said, but he made people sit up and listen. Kathy, um, so one person sort of representing uh, a view of the arts, I mean, Mate through that particular lens, could tell us what you think. Um, you know, I think that the Mate regime's impact on the arts, I, mean, I think it's complex, it's multifold, and it's contradictory. It's also ever evolving, right? I mean, even as we, uh, as we talk about the impact that he's had on us, that impact is changing because circumstances are changing, the way that practice occurs change. Um, so I wanted to talk about just two things. I thought, you know, I'd start off by just picking up on two things that I talk about in the essay. And one um, is when we talk about the Mahathir years, we often, in our minds, comes this idea of, of the opulence of the 1990s. But in fact, when I look at the arts, at arts practice, I really think that the relationship between the arts community, and again, I'm generalizing, really, I'm talking about very urban-based, uh, kind of mainstream, embedded within, kind of, you know, more, much more globalized kind of art practice here, um, was the, the fact that his, the early years of the Mahathi regime was one of great political and social turmoil. This was Operation Lalang, you had the crisis of the judiciary, um, the, the suppression of the press, the attacks on the universities. So you've got that whole early years that 
I think, built the foundation in some ways for the way that certain people in the arts community um, saw themselves in relation to him. And you, you know, Michael mentioned this word of a kind of you know, half conversation. In some ways, I think that really is a beautiful phrase to explain really how, what was our relationship with, with him and his power. Um, so there's one. Um, I think it also enabled us to, so it allowed artists to kind of exercise their function as social critics, as uh, vi witnesses of his, you know, to history, one. The second thing is it gave, I think, the arts community or artists a kind of focal point. It was such a, he's such a large, he was, is such a large presence that it really, in some ways, made our job quite easy because there was so much, there was just a wealth of, of um, subject matter and interventions that we could make and did make. Um, and the other thing is, as suppression of dissent grew, the ability of the arts to use metaphor and symbolism, I think, become, became much more powerful. So you find it in theatre, for example, through Instant Cafe Theatre, through, through um, even Ki Tuan Chai's work. Right? I mean, using the imagination, using kind of slates of hand to try and address some of the things that you could not read in the New Straits Times was an important function as well. These things, I believe, started in the 80s. Um, it was also after Operation Lalang was the rise of civil society. So, you know, a much more organized form of Swaram, Hakam, all of these groups really began to consolidate and to have to build stronger infrastructures, which I really do believe that in the 1990s and when 98 happened, really paid a lot of dividends for the way that people organized themselves. So, the, and okay, and the second thing I guess is the economy. You know, everyone talks about how the 1990s in Malaysia, there was this wealth, and I know there are definitely critiques to it, and we, we understand now that there was nothing exceptional about Southeast Asia and the Asian tiger economy. But um, living in that moment, and I was a new gra fresh graduate then, living in that moment, um, coming out into the world and suddenly being part of this, this abundance was, um, I mean, it was fantastic. It was fantastic as a practitioner. It was fantastic for me as a young person. And, you know, I don't want to, um, yeah, I think, you know, I have to acknowledge that, you know, I was completely bought into it as well. But what it did as well is it allowed us to build infrastructure. There was lots of money for infrastructure. The middle class grew. There was a much more bigger kind of sense of the market for the arts, whether it was theater or for collectors buying work. There was more funding. We drew much more international attention. So you had international Malaysian artists making a pre their presence felt in exhibitions and biennales internationally, where before really there wasn't. It wasn't that the, our work was not good. It was just that we were quite geopolitically quite insignificant. Um, yeah, and there was a sense of pride and possibility, I think, also that helped. Um, so, you know, that, but as the arts developed, so I think artists were able to kind of build on this flow of capital that came into our practice, one, but we were also very aware of the fact that, you know, we, we had a particular social and cultural capital that was much greatly enhanced by our ability to critique the Mahathe regime. So those two things, I think, you know, are things that I think are worth exploring a bit more. Thank you, Kathy. I, I don't know how many of you went for an exhibition that was um, set up uh, some years ago <coughs> at the National Art Gallery, and uh, part of that exhibition had a corridor on one side, every Agong that we've had, right? So, uh, and our Agongs typically, uh, you know, rotate every five years. And against, and on the other wall was the corresponding prime minister. And as you walk down this, this, this timeline, as it were, of Agongs, you suddenly were made uh, very, it was made very clear to you that was this, there was this presence of a prime minister uh, who, who just kept, coming back. I mean, it was just an Agung, there was Dr. Mate, and there was another Agung, there was Dr. Mate. And, you know, and the joke, at one point, I think it was the 90s, was that in Britain, they had a prime minister every five years and a monarch for life. And in Malaysia, we had a monarchs every five years and a, and a prime minister for life. And because he didn't, uh, but 22 years is, uh, is substantial. And I remember uh, when he stepped down, um, the, the celebrations for uh, 
to that occasion. I mean, there was that dramatic moment when he declared he was going to step down. But then when he actually stepped down, the world's media turned up in Malaysia. And in fact, there was, it created um, a deficit in something. It's a very rare commodity. It's called the fixer. And there were not enough fixers. And I was, uh, became a fixer for, the BBC t for BBC TV. And as a result, uh, watched women in pink jump out of planes uh, with the parachutes. Uh, so um, it was, uh, this was done by Azalini of side and her, um, uh, her putri wing of Amno. Uh, we could come back to those moments, but I think we probably all share some special moments in our relationship to this man. I want to c want to pick up the, the question of the economy uh, and invite uh, Hafiz Nosham to kind of tell us, I mean, what do we know now about the economy? Everybody kind of credits Marte for... Um, for the, the successes, uh, perhaps in some of the uh, difficult choices that were made during the Asian financial crisis, but the, we, we credit him and him alone. But of course we are in a building uh, that I believe is owned by the man who used to be his uh, finance minister. And uh, clearly there were other people, lieutenants uh, and others responsible. But Hafiz, what do we, how can we kind of succinctly put, in, uh, kind of describe Mahathir's legacy in terms of our economic orientation? Um, yeah, he wasn't alone, but uh, I think he wasn't the guy that, that got everyone together. He was a team builder. I mean, wasn't a team builder. He managed to find the right person <laughs> to get to do what he wants to do. Um, because, uh, well, I think, I, I think if you, to understand all these people, Halim Sa'ad, um, uh, the guy that owns the building, uh, you have to understand what happened in the 80s, especially in terms of industry. I think we can mention his name, actually. Yeah, actually, actually, for some reason, because I'm so young, I've forgotten his name, but I know him. <laughs> but, but the point, yeah, that I'm sorry, uh, but, but I think the thing you need to understand in the 80s was really the, the beginning of the industrialization of Malaysia. Uh, because previously, uh, it wasn't so much industrialization going on. Uh, even, even, even in 19... In 1969, for instance, there were arguments that said that nothing so much happened under Tunku that uh, the Malay peasant actually revolted against him. It was essentially the, um, the Rish riot. Uh, but Mahade understood that, I suppose, and he, he invested in industrialization in Malaysia. He invited all his foreign, foreign uh, companies into Malaysia, the Japanese especially, uh, in, terms, in terms of Proton, in terms of Mitsubishi, Mitsui. Uh, but along the way, because of the realization, uh, he, he liberalized the NEP, but also at the same time, he was also hung up with the idea of uh, creating the Malay middle class, Malay in the Australis, in fact. Uh, so, but this is where all these people came in. Uh, in fact, I think I have to explain the recession of the 19, 19, 19, in the middle of the 1980s. That's when, right after the bonanza of the, of the uh, what do you call that, the OPEC uh, sanction. That, that made oil prices go up like crazy. Um, so suddenly, oil prices collapse. I mean, it collapsed today, but it happened before. A lot of people forget about this. So suddenly, government, suddenly, before they had a lot of money, they can do whatever they want with the NEP. Suddenly, they had no money. So they had to do privatization. They had to keep uh, government spending down, deficit down. So when they do privatization, um, guess who they privatized to? All these people, to Zaim Zawudin, to Gaffa Baba, when the people that are... Uh, there's one particular company, I've forgotten the name, by Zaim, Zaim Zawudin, that, that did Paremba, I think, was Paremba. Um, so all these people in Paremba suddenly become the close Mahade uh, operative. Uh, Zaim Zawudin, uh, Halim Sa'an even. Uh, so the privatization of all this uh, government, previously government, uh, um, entities um, like Malaysian Airlines, like Time Engineering, like a couple of others as well. So this happened in the 1980s because the government needed to save money. It's not so much because Mahadi was a new liberal, but because Mahadi was a pragmatist. Uh, Mahadi has always been pragmatist, even in terms of industrialization. Uh, they, they, he pursued two separate tracks. One was really, you know, export led. Uh, industrialization, when they allow all these uh, foreign investors to come in and, and build plants and give them, uh, what do you call that, uh, yeah, credits, uh, 
just because, because in manufacturing, especially, they for manufacturing ownership, uh, liberalization of the ownership, they, they were this quota that's supposed to be reserved for the Malays. But Mahadi abolished that for manufacturing. That's part of the reason why Ma Malaysia, uh, you know, grew up so fast. Because, because the, gov the government took a very liberal view of manufacturing. But at the same time, you, you have this export-led a new liberal, I suppose, model. Also, you also have this import substitution model. This is where the industrialization, uh, the, the NEP sort of industrialization ha uh, happened, where you have, um, you know, UEM, Renault, uh, all these people, like uh, this another person that, under, that used to run Proton. What was his name? He died in a helicopter crash. Yeah, 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 Ahmad. So these are Malay industrialists. And also, they, also, they are also YTL and Embajaya, but uh, the focus has always been on these Malay industrialists that, that crash and burn in 1987. That, that's also another chapter on, on Mahade era. That's when Mahade had a huge success in the beginning of the privatization, but he crashed in 1987. But in some ways, he, he managed to crash pretty well. Um, yeah. That's, uh, but we can start. We can come back to those some of the themes, right? Mahathir's ideas, what he pushed for, their successes and failures. It's interesting that this panel is framed by the, the large NEP piece there by Ise, uh, and, and the question is, what is Mahathir's relationship to the NEP? But also, uh, Kung Yu's or Lu Kung Yu's uh, Chadangan Chadangan Untuk Negaraku uh, piece there is this beautifully constructed thing, but shows you. I mean, was was the end of I mean, were the objectives of the NEP to basically allow for the construction of these kind of like personal fantasies of aristocracy? I mean, the proliferation of, you know, and use of... There are probably more Doric columns in, in you know, s districts in uh, the Klang Valley than there are in all of Europe. But, uh, but there you have it. Was this what we, you know, what we wanted? Was this the end result? Um, and that's part of the exhibition. I think if you look around, you'll see many more kind of um, subtle and sometimes not so subtle critiques of the, uh, what Malaysia was as a country. I'm going to call upon Jaba Sadeh because recently with the Malaysian inside, he'd rather be described as a jobless uh, journalist. But I think we all know better. Uh, Jaba. So, hi, good evening. Um, so, talking about being jobless, um, Inside it closed down on March 15th, um, and three days later, uh, the Friday 18th, um, we had an interview with Dr. Mahate. So imagine this, Dr. Mahate Mohammad, Prime Minister for so long, very powerful man, has an interview with a website that has closed down. Right? Um, and, and so I just want to relate something here and, and can get the conversation going along. Uh, one of the questions we asked him was, um, was he sorry? And he said, what do I have to be sorry about? Um, Najib says, you know, if you think I should be sorry about Najib, then you have to go and dig to Hussein On's grave and ask him to apologize for making me prime minister. Right? So, so, I mean, how do you ask a question for a man who gives this kind of replies? Right? How, how do you go on? Because his, his logic is just amazing, right? Uh, and so he goes on like this for, for a long time. And, and then he says, um, at one part he says, don't demonize me. Never ever demonize me. No matter what you say, just remember, I won five elections with two-thirds majority. So every Malaysian who voted for me agreed with what I did. And you know, you can't, you can't argue with that logic too, right? He, of course, he didn't say he suppressed the media, he had ISA, he had this and that. He had everything, and then he did more, and he centralized everything in the office of the Prime Minister. Anything you wanted to do, you had to go to the office of the Prime Minister. Uh, there was a unit called uh, EPU, uh, Economic Planning Unit. In his time, I mean, everybody had a privatization proposal. It was known as the Express Photo Setting Unit. For the simple reason, anybody came with a pitch with an idea, someone within the EPU would take the idea and give it to one of the industrialists that uh, Hafiz was talking about. Today, the EPU 
is known as the Economic Propaganda Unit because they have a minister or someone that passes off as a minister. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is, you can see from Dr. Mahathir's time, and I think he's a brilliant man, all said and done. That even uh, 13 years after he's retired, we're still talking about him. 13 years after he's retired, he's still rewriting his legacy. You know, um, 18 years after he sacked Anwar Ibrahim, he walks into a courtroom and shakes the hand of the man he sacked 18 years ago. I mean, would any one of us do this? Only one man, right? Dr. Mahathir Mohamed. So I like to think that he's a brilliant man in many ways. I admire him as much as I admire Najib Razak. To be able to take all the insults, all the innuendos, accusations, and still walk down and speak to President Barack Obama. I mean, seriously, you have to admire these kind of people. They leave a legacy that's amazing. And as they, as they continue to live, uh, they see what we are doing to them, uh, what uh, Kathy was talking about, uh, the arts community that, that by slate of hand, uh, by innuendo, uh, uh, criticize him. Um, Michael Vatikadis in the Fires and Economic Review, the things they wrote then, and, and some of it was banned in Malaysia. I remember I was in the New Straits Times, wow. I was in the New Straits Times, we used to get it photostatted and faxed over from Hong Kong. Right? So we lived through a lot of difficult times in Malaysia when Dr. Mahathir was the Prime Minister, but we survived it. So at the end of the interview, I told him, Sir, I don't expect you to apologize to us, really, because the apology won't change anything. We have to do this ourselves. Having said that, we're still depending on this man, 91-year-old man, <laughs> to f form an alliance with a 69-year-old man in prison to get rid of another man. You know, I, I think it just says very poorly for Malaysians. You know, I'm embarrassed as a Malaysian that I'm cheering these two men. Personally, I'm not. I think it's up to us. But I like, I like to think that his legacy, his time in office, his time after office gives us valuable lessons as we move forward uh, as a Malaysia that really wants to be Merdeka from, from this kind of patriarchal, benevolent, dictatorial politicians. So let's start it now. Okay, thanks Jabba. I want to see if we can shape this conversation a little around the fact that we are in an art gallery. The fact that, uh, uh, named, uh, called Ilham. Ilham because it's the Malay word for inspiration, right? And so, w what is it about the way Mahathir governed the way power was distributed and yield, uh, wielded in those 22 years, that shaped deeper questions of culture. And I think that is something we could maybe explore. Might not, we might not be able to come up with easy answers, but how culturally did we change? Uh, we have uh, a lot of outward expressions. We had what was in 2020, this kind of rhetorical and propaganda efforts. We had uh, expressions like bole. You know, Malaysia bole was the big, kind of rallying call, right? We can do it, assertiveness, not just for the country, but for individuals, you know, climbing a mountain, having the longest, biggest bowl of roja, or the longest, mm. I don't know. So I would say, I'm thinking Lap Chong, but I'm sure that's yeah. completely not kosher. We dropped, a, we dropped kosher. a proton over the north. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so we dropped cars. Very interesting. Yeah. Those were things that we were proud of in those days. We dropped a car from, uh, from Great Heights. Uh, Michael. An important, one, an important one to me, and I was just thinking along the same lines, was the term Malayu Baru. And I think for me now, as I, as I think of the legacy, I mean, we can talk a lot as we were preoccupied very much during his time in power with the way he wielded power. And I think what we often miss, therefore, was the way in which he forged society. Um, and, you know, Kathy made reference to the abundance that was, I think, the... Um, that was the putty that he used to sort of, you know, mold the society because there was a lot of money. Uh, he knew how to handle the business community. He knew how to make, uh, you know, how to promote people who could make money. Um, and that abundance provided a base on which he could forge what he, I think, believed was a truly modern society. Because, again, being a man of great, um, I think, paradox in the sense that, you know, his traditional roots were, I think, very shallow. Uh, and yet he never quite made it into the modern world. He didn't have the foreign education 
um, that maybe he aspired to. Um, you know, he didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge like, like Lee Kuan Yew. Um, and yet I think he had a very modern mindset. Um, and, and he wanted to forge Malaysian society in that modern mold. And therefore his legacy is very important, or at least how it has begun to unravel. And this is what really truly concerns me about Malaysia today, which is the bonsification of Malay society, the Arabization, the way in which society has started to, to move backwards almost um, from, the, from where he had pushed it. And I, I felt that at the time he was pushing people, particularly perhaps the Malay community, into areas that they were not quite comfortable with. Um, but nonetheless, I think it did have a modernizing, um, uh, very contemporary effect on society. And so that the Malaysia I lived in in the mid-1990s was a thoroughly modern society, uh, or at least one that, that aspired to that. The Malaysia that I sometimes see today is not. So this is an interesting theme, right? The, the, the great modernizer that Mahathir often, it's a label that's given to him. Uh, the push, but also the pushback. And we saw uh, to, um, over the decades, pushbacks, and not just with the the, the cosmopolitan elite uh, and the human rights group who saw the dark side to some of the trade-offs with development, but also in terms of what people wanted to define for themselves as a good life, uh, a life that maybe was defined by religious values, by the social co cohesiveness, rather than the kind of acquisitive, self-possessed individual that is the hallmark of a, a good modern bourgeois uh, individual, right? So, Kathy, in, when you look at theatre, what did it reflect all these kinds of uh, strains in society? And do you see this in some of the artwork here? Is there any piece of work that you particularly like? Um, maybe I'll talk about theatre to begin with, right? Um, when I think about the works in the 1990s, I think there are two things. One, you operate on the kind of what was staged, what you experience as an audience, or what, you know, um, theatre makers put on stage, and I think that there was a very conscious effort in English language theatre, at least, to try and stage um, an imagined Malaysia, Malaysia that in some ways was being slowly disallowed um, in our reality. So you had a Malaysia that was very cosmo, uh, you know, a very multicultural, that was very open. I think about um, As Is, uh, was it an Instant Cafe production? And it was one of the first plays that actually, not only was it a play about homosexuality, but then, you know, it, it was, I think, uh, it built a relationship with Pink Triangle, which was, you know, one of the, the new NG, the early NGOs that was working with HIV, um, early, early 90s. So, you know, you, and you, if you really look at a lot of the subject matter in the plays that were staged, whether they were locally written or they were plays that were taken from outside of Malaysia, you had this stream of a very... Um, kind of progressive, open society that was very inclusive. Um, so that was, I think, for, for me anyway, it was a kind of imagined what, what Malaysia could be, that it could be this country that was very rooted in a, in a Southeast Asian, Malay, Malaysian context, but yet was also extremely open, which was the sort of KL that was being built, uh, you know, like it or not. So that was one. I think structurally, though, when I think about the infrastructure and the way that we organized ourselves as artists and as art groups, you know, there was a big distinction between Malay language theater and English language theater. You saw an emergence of Chinese language practice, for example, that was happening as well, uh, and which is all fantastic. But now, in 2014, when I, 16, when I look back, I also realized that, um, you know, there has emerged in this vacuum kind of funders and sponsors that will sponsor work, you know, based on a particular kind of ethnic identity, for example. So, you know, you, you do find that within some, some arts groups have managed to accrue to themselves a lot of funding from individual patrons or from companies that will identify with them because, let's say, they are of a particular, the work is defined as, you know, Chinese, for example, even if the artists themselves may not subscribe to that. So I think that is something that we really haven't talked about, you know. Afez, um, Malayu Baru, I mean, th I just want to ask you on a personal level, um, and I, I follow you on Twitter, uh, Hafiz Nosham is on Twitter, by the way, um, and he's very, uh, he's very active, so you might want to follow him, uh, and he comments on everything. Um, <laughs> Malayu Baru, I mean, this, 
do these visions coming from the Prime Minister's department really affect individuals, Malay individuals? Uh, do you think Mahate shaped the Malay mind? And I know there's a, it's a kind of an odd question because I don't myself believe there's anything like a Malay mind. But to, that, to the extent that we could use that as a way of talking uh, about culture, do you, do you see the effects? I mean, do you, do you see, does it resonate with you uh, and your generation? Obviously a much younger generation than the one that Mahathir was uh, dealing with uh, in the first instance. Oh well, yeah, I mean, I grew up during Mahadi era. I mean, for what, for the most of my life, he was the only prime minister that I knew. Uh, and when, when Badawi came, was really, uh, what's going on here? Something, things going down the drain or something like that. But yeah, I, I think, Mahadi was an authoritarian person. I mean, he, he was everywhere, in the papers, uh, in, in schools. Even when I, I sang Wawa San Wofodoklo at school, I mean, he's, that's when, we, when, when I sang that song, I don't remember the words anymore, but, but when I sang of it, I, I, I think of him, because he is a prime minister. He was the one that had Wawa San Wofodoklo. This is his ancient And, and um, yeah, Mahdi, because Mahdi was such authoritarian, he and also he was a, such a large figure in in many ways. His image, his his his, his, his the culture that he imposed on people. Uh, it's just that I think uh, because the modernization that happened, the situation that happened, he influenced like you know uh, Michael was talking about how the, how how Mahdi was a modernist in that, in that way, and then when he got he was gone. Suddenly, you have this, all this uh, the rural the Islamist culture coming back uh, to 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 reinstate himself in the Malaysian culture. I think that's you know, funnily enough, the 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 the, the modernization of the Malay mind, so to speak, stopped when Mahadi was gone. When Badawi came, Badawi was the son of a ulama. It is it's such a huge uh, difference between those two. But do you think it was a question of uh, Mate putting a lid on something or Mate incorporating the Islamic agenda? Or was it a question that, was it really that it wasn't there when Mate was around and just re-emerged because he'd left? Or was it always part of the deal? No, no he did. He, he, I remember when he set up uh, an institution, I forget what it was called, it was, um, it was a, an institute of Islamic studies, you know, all leaders in South, I, yeah, that's right. Ikim? Ikim. And, and I remember at the time, thinking, how is he going to do this? You know, it, it, because on the one hand, you had Anwar at the time with his civilizational dialogues and his you know, references to uh, Moorish Spain and, and all his sort of um, uh, literary allusions to Islamic civilizations. And here's Mahathir, the pragmatist. You know, he knew that he had pass at the door. He had to do something about it. And so he did, I think, what he did best, which is to be very practical and set up an institution that was going to find a way of bolting modernization onto Islam, whether, you know, whether, it, could, you know, whether it was uh, doable or not. And I don't think it was a success because of that, because uh, Anwar, I think, in many ways, was more successful in, in, in interpreting for people in a very alluring way the extent to which there was a modern vision, a civilizational vision of Islam. Mahathir was not very good at that. Um, so I, I think that in many ways it, it was the other aspect of Mahathir's um, government, if you like, which was forcing this pace of modernization, forcing um, the, the people who felt um, that they, they perhaps felt more traditionally minded, forcing them to think a different way. Um, so, and I think that's what kept it at bay, uh, not his attempts to interpret Islam in a modern way. Jabba, Kathy. Uh, uh, you know, this point, I think one of the things that he did with Islam, you know, to undercut kind of past was also to deploy it as a way to, you know, well, you know, actually being Muslim is progressive. It makes you progressive. It makes you work hard. He was trying to kind of pull those elements of it to fit in with his industrialization process. Yeah, this right? sounds like uh, the Protestant business, the Catholic. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, you know, the, the good old work, yeah, work yeah. ethic, right? Yeah. But, and, and so some of the works that we have here, works by people like Bayou Tomo, for example, um, I think you know this. This you you have this really strong idea of the Malay male, and there's a lot that's been said about the emergence, re-emergence of the figurative in Malaysian art in the 1990s. And I, I actually don't think that's true. And um, Hasnul Saidon has written about it to show that in fact you know there's actually there was always 
there was never really the so-called prohibition against the figurative in Muslim art, although it's lauded by every local and foreign art historian that you read. But in fact, that you know, there was something. But when I look at these works, I think about how there was, Mahathir was trying to use this idea of Malayness and Islam towards a very particular agenda. But I see these works as actually countering those things. And so it's quite subtle, but you know, the, 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 the placing of the anguish of the Malay male in some of the works that are here, I think is a counterpoint that's interesting. Jabba. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I, for me, Dr. Mahathir tried to write the Islamic tiger. He co-opted Anwar in, uh, you know, a, a matter of record, he's the one who set up Bank Islam. Anything Islam was actually Mahathir Muhammad, it wasn't Anwar Ibrahim. Um, and and he, wa he was on record as saying, uh, he was asked, why doesn't he grow a beard as any pious Muslim would? So you don't see us growing a beard. Um, and he said, you know, because the Prophet Muhammad didn't have Gillette. And, and that caused a huge uproar at the time. Uh, you know, because you know, be practical, be modern. Uh, Islam is not about appearances and rituals. It's about being progressive. It's about science and learning. Um, and I think after he left office, I, I, he left it in the hands of a man he thought he could sort of direct. Uh, but obviously, Pala had other ideas, or had people with other ideas. And, and so it went south. And, and I think the Islam that was repressed in the 70s, uh, you know, represented by the Hadi Awangs and, and all that, it came back in full force um, because of the Iranian Revolution and all that. It just came back and, and grabbed Malaysia by the ball, so to speak, you know, in, in the Sarong and said, no, let's drag us back to the agrarian uh, mindset of the traditional Malay, which is, you know, I pray five times a day, I've got enough to live for myself, I don't need that. And the other point is, of course, all these gentlemen from the 60s and 70s who were drinking their gins and their stengas and waltzing away, suddenly have middle class guilt. They come back and they send their kids to Agama school and all that. And that's why what we have, this weird Malaysia today, which is not one Malaysia at all. It's, 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 it's uh, many onion layers, which, which brings you to tears of what, what we are, right? Uh, on one level, we are modern. You look at all these buildings. We're building more buildings uh, by a prime minister who wears robes uh, on New Year's Eve, you know, and has prayer sessions in Dataran Merdeka. So, so, you know, Michael was saying this now about Arabization. I, I, th I am cynical. I think they're just prostituting Islam. Seriously. I wouldn't say Mahathir was doing it. I said the current crop is doing it. And maybe it's a legacy of how they saw Mahathir using Islam to control the Islamists. Um, to, to, to bend them to his will and take Malaysia uh, beyond as one of the modern countries. I mean, after all, his, his idol was Kamal Ataturk, who, who brought down the Ottoman Empire. You know, um, so I think he wanted to go that way. But we had other ideas. Well, not we, but we generally have other ideas. Okay, I think probably time now to bring in, you know, to, to take questions from the floor or comments. Uh, if you keep them fairly short, just identify who you are, your name, and, and you know, make your comment or, or ask a question directed to any of the members of the panel or to everyone. Uh, you, can, you can take it, yeah. And uh, we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll... Yeah, no, go ahead. Good. Oh, no, sorry, you work for the gallery. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Liana. Um, so my question is um, related to what you guys were discussing just now about, I think we don't have a Malaysian identity. We don't, and that's why we are very confused. And so we, we now ascribe more towards religious identity rather than ethnicity and everything else. Um, do you think that if we were to have another authoritarian leader like Mahadir, we could make it work. Like someone who forced a Malaysian identity onto everyone else. Okay, so uh, the interesting question, a question whether we need a strong leader that galvanized Malaysia. Do we have any more questions from the, for, please? Um, yep, the two questions, take them in turn. Just identify yourself, please. Anwar, um, I, I think that related to that also is the issue of, we continually struggle with what is the Malay identity and what is the Malaysian identity? And somehow we're not going to be able to separate the two. And I think that's quite critical because the Chinese and Indians keep quiet. Um, but, you know, for, for reasons of population, 
and the control of uh, media and GLCs, you know, the debate is really, you know, what is a Malay and separately what's a Malaysian? And unless you subgrade one to the other, you're not going to resolve the issue. Right. I think the Sultan of Johor has a solution. He calls it Bangsa Johor. So he's reconciled it. Yeah, and he's interesting because he just accused Dr. Mahathir of being the most divisive phys uh, uh, figure in Malaysian politics, whereas he is the great uniter. So maybe we, the future is Johorian. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, there was another question. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marzuki. I would like to raise a suggestion. Perhaps after all that we have seen throughout the years, this is probably one of the causes of having a perlembagaan that places Malay religion up on top. Would you think that perhaps the best solution would to turn Malaysia into a purely circular state so that everybody can work towards a common goal? Okay, the centrality of Malayness and Malay society to the Malaysian project. Uh, one more question before we go. Anwar, do you want to? But you'll have to take the mic, Anwar. It's being uh, recorded. Well, it, it puzzles me always that in the case of Malaysia, the, the largest community, which is the Malay community, that did not actually call for support was supported. So normally what happens in oppressed societies or, you know, they say, oh, we're a minority, please help us. The, the really odd thing I think about Malaysia is that nobody said, please help us amongst the Malay community. Somebody just decided to help them. That's an interesting interpretation of history. Does anybody uh, agree? I mean, we had the, Sorry, the Malay councils just, of the 60s. Can Sorry. I just counter that? Okay. Um, because just of economy, because of disparity, because of inequality in economy, the Malays actually call out to say, please help us, because the Malays were really, really poor. This was back in Tun Razak's time. And so that was why, I mean, that kind of built into what Mahadir's original idea was, to kind of like empower this Malay middle class. So we did call out for help a little bit. Okay, well, so here's uh, the I, question. I'd like to take the strong leader uh, question because I think it's very interesting and I was reflecting on this on the way here that the, the brand of strong leadership that Mahathir represented and to some extent Lee Kuan Yew represented and Su Suharto represented, that sort of previous generation of soft authoritarian leaders um, is now a thing of the past. Um, now you have the new brand of strong leadership which is driven by um, democratic impulses, uh, popularly elected, uh, populist leaders, um, who nonetheless use a brand of, of, of strong leadership that they claim is um, from the people for the people. Um, and, and I think just thinking of this personally for a moment, uh, the long period of time that I've lived in this part of the world, now more than 35 years, I miss the old brand of strong leadership, <laughs> um, which was more paternalistic. Um, yes, you felt that, you felt why are we being told all the time, but I actually miss the vision that they had, and you, I think, referred to it. Um, it, 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 it was a, an exclusivist, vision in the sense that it was one man's vision, but it was one nonetheless that you could relate to. Uh, now, and I, I actually I think that Najib Tun Razak is the least successful of the new brand of leaders we see in Southeast Asia, and he's having to use some very old-fashioned uh, means of clinging to power. But, I mean, if I look at the Philippines and Thailand and, 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 to, some, and, and to a great extent Indonesia, uh, the vision is actually not all that sophisticated and not, um, uh, you know, all that uh, imaginative. Um, yes, it may come from um, the masses, so to speak, but it's actually not necessarily driving the countries in the right direction. And so what I do miss from that brand of strong leadership is the fact um, that people's perception were molded by a speech or a slogan. Um, and it, you know, he didn't always get it completely wrong. Do you, uh, Jabba, you said you were ashamed that Malaysians were looking to a nanogenarian and a man incarcerated yeah. to affect political change in this country. Yeah. Right? Do you, do you subscribe to Michael's uh, longing for the return of Big Daddy uh, in politics? You know, somebody, well, I wouldn't you know, go that at, far. But you know, it's like, I, 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 because what, I, 
I can see where he comes from. I, I, I can see where he comes from. Uh, I lived through that times too. I can see where he comes from. It's certain, you know what you're going to get. Yeah. You outsource everything to, this, to the grandfather. He, he takes care of everything, you know. So, so we've had all these leaders, Suharto, Marcos, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Mahathir Mohamad. We had that, and it was good times, right? I mean, well, General Newin in the region. Yes, that General Newin. Not so successful, perhaps. But, but yeah, he, he took the country back away from the system. Uh, you had uh, Indira Gandhi. They're all very strong, very powerful people. Uh, I think it's great at that time. Uh, because we were not much smarter then. There were not many people going to universities. Now we have too many universities, still not many smart people. But, but what we have is we have a smarter class of people, of younger people represented by Hafiz, uh, taking bus rides in Sri Lanka. But you have a much smarter class of people. And I think it's, it's a lot better we, we don't have leaders who overstay their welcome. You know, I think the American system is good. Two terms, peace, thank you very much, get out. Let's go and suffer from another guy. I'd rather that system rather than a strong man forever, because, I mean, you just saw what happened in Uzbekistan. The guy died. They waited a week to tell the world that the guy died, right? How can you live like that, right? But I'd like to take the question about a secular constitution. I thought we had a secular constitution. <laughs> I'm surprised that we don't have a secular constitution. But it's not made that way. No, it is made that way. It's just that you're made to understand it in a different way. Right? I think the problem for me with the federal constitution is, and I think your problem would be really the Article 160 that defines a Malay has to be a Muslim. Exactly. That just screws you up, right? I'm I mean, a Malay Muslim, but I don't you're, 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 if you're Malay, you have to be Muslim in Malaysia. You, you can't even say you're Malay Muslim. It's redundant, right? But you know, if you're Malay in the Philippines, you're not Muslim. You don't have to be Muslim also in Indonesia. So I think that's the part that really kills me and comes to the point where Anwar was trying to say, you, what's a, you define the Malay, what's the Malay identity, Malaysian identity. Uh, the, the dominant majority in our country, uh, I, I can't even say that anymore because the Sabahs and Sarawakins are reproducing at a faster rate. Uh, but the dominant majority in the country have to figure out, and they can't because they're pigeonholed by the constitution. Right? You speak Malay, you are Malay, therefore you are Muslim. How do you get out of it? So the hudud thing is just going to, you know, it's, it's, you know your Article 8 is gone. Right? You're not equal. So I think that's a part which, we, which all of us wrestle with and we can't get out of. And now the government, the ruling parties are using Islam again. Because now everybody can be a Malay. A mama can be a Malay. Well, not me, but most mamas are Malay, right? So now your only identity as a Malay really is uh, Shafi Islam, right? I, I think that really, uh, that's really a big problem for most Malays. Can we come back to the question of do we need uh, a strong leader, uh, you know, a charismatic ma individual to galvanize the nation? In fact, do we even, act to even need to galvanize the nation and mobilize it in that way? I mean, is that is that something that we must take for granted? What was the arts? I mean, Kathy, when you look back at the arts theatre, what was it? Um, reflecting in terms of desires coming from something other than the state. I mean, what were the fantasies of Malaysians? Clearly, uh, Kung Yu kind of states it there, right? He kind of captures and documents what people's fantasies are. Very, very uh, simple, parochial, domestic fantasies of the good life, you know, in these architectural forms. And, you know, Kung Yu's genius is to elevated into something that, you know, you could, could see the artistry uh, even in the kitsch. What else do you think was going on in terms of the arts uh, that reflected some of these deeper cultural uh, struggles? I mean, I look at this work and I think it's obviously aspirational, but it's also completely problematic and it really, to me, tells me so much about Mahathir. I mean, Michael was talking about how uncomfortable Dr. Mahathir was, you know, within the Javanese traditional context. And you only need to understand that when he had a chance to build one of the biggest cultural institutions in our country, he chose to build a Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra, right? Um, you know, and you look at the architecture here, and, you know, this is what the, we were told to aspire to, you know, because really being Asian wasn't good enough. So as much as he, you know, shaped himself as this third world, um, you know, bulldog, he, you know, there's a kind of deep kind of sense of insecurity within him, you know, and so you kind of, then you go into this idea of, you know, the post-colonial kind of, you know, sense of identity, but maybe setting that aside, I actually want to come back to your question about, and this, so as a woman, let me tell you, 
you know what? No, we don't need another, you know, patriarchal leader. Um, as much as you all may wish it, you know, guys. Um, <laughs> oh, so there are matriarchal um, ones too. Yeah, yeah, women can be patriarchal too in Gandhi, right? Um, <laughs> strong leaders, uh, you know, I mean, states operate whether they are, you know, through repressive means or through ideological means. And maybe with Mahathir and through some of the things that he did with Vision 2020, there was this sense, it was strong, or we bought into the particular ideology of it more than anything else. Um, and that was when it was most successful. When it began to disintegrate really was when the challenges came with the economy breaking down and when Anwar Ibrahim then presented a challenge to him, that allowed PASS to rise. And that's when Mahathir then came up with his declaration that because PASS said, no, we will make Malaysia an Islamic state. Because constitutionally, it's not, and maybe it is, there is something in it, right? What is the name of the Islamic constitu the constitutional scholar from UIA? And he, I think he said that the, the Malaysian constitution, you know, Islam is not a, it's not a, Islam is not, we're not in an Islamic state, but Islam is present in the constitution, which I think leads to the ambiguity that we all are now caught up in, right? Um, but it was a declaration that when I think Lim, Lim Kitsiang said something that this is no, Malaysia is not an Islamic state, and Mahathir then said, it is an Islamic state. And from that moment, you know, if you track it down, it's a kind of empowering of a particular kind of thing. When you put it out there, it becomes part of the discourse. And to walk it back is our problem, right? Okay, I've got to take more questions from the floor. There's an individual there in the front seat. Anybody else? Just hold up your hand so the mic will come to you. Please. Oh, hi. Okay. Your name? Oh, uh, my name is Amy. Um, first of all, I I just like to um, address what Michael said. Uh, I think I I get what Michael was trying to say. He was saying that the old leaders were visionary. As somebody who actually lived in Indonesia, um, I arrived in Indonesia six weeks before Suharto stepped down, and I witnessed the entire carnage, the riots, the anti-Chinese um, rioting and Indonesia's entire transition from an from a autocracy to a democracy. And let me tell you, it was very, very bloody. It, they paid a tremendous price for the democracy. But having said that, um, y you know what Michael said? Actually, in a way, it is true. It's not that I wish for a strong man to return. But if you look at the current crop of leaders um, in this part of the world, I don't see a visionary in any one of them. You have a great, um, you have a great, um, huge outpouring of democracy where everyone can uh, participate in choosing their own leaders. But the leaders that they've elected, you know, subsequently, um, none of them fail. None of them lived up to expectations. Uh, perhaps the one that I think that actually did make a lot of difference was actually the first democratically uh, elected president of Indonesia called Guzdor, um, even though he was. A very chaotic but he did do two very great things like one he got rid of the military and and ushered in a, a civilian government and secondly he gave the he gave rights to the to the Chinese in Indonesia so there is there um, there's 20 years that's missing from my life because I I was away from from Malaysia and actually I was working for the star when it got shut down um, by Dr. Mahathir I was a teenager then <laughs> so and maybe it's fair for me to say the Dr. Matteo that I knew was the Dr. Matteo that I, I came to know while living overseas. Like, for example, every time he came to Hong Kong or Indonesia where I was working, I really marveled at this man who put me out of a job, was so open in, in taking on really difficult questions. He, he would just take questions from the floor and he would even extend it. And it was amazing because you know, when I went to live in Indonesia, it was different. If they don't want to talk to you, they don't want to talk to you. But Matteo, wow, he was so open and so brilliant in uh, replying. And I felt kind of proud of him, actually. And so if you were to ask me, I actually knew Mahathir when I was out of my own country. Okay, but coming back to the questions, I actually have two questions. Because when I returned to Malaysia, I couldn't help but notice that how much more conservative we had become in terms of, uh, in terms of being uh, Muslim because um, I experienced a, a fantastic experience in Indonesia where people were very open and actually 
a lot of my knowledge about Islam comes from my time in Indonesia where I was always welcome to the mosque, welcome to huge prayer sessions where there are like 150,000 people praying. They don't care that I wasn't carrying a scarf. So my knowledge of Islam came from Indonesia. And um, I just want to know, because I, I notice a lot of people here in the room are modern. Uh, I don't see many people having beards or none at all or being veiled. Um, do you consider yourself a minority in the country right now, those who are not so pious, number one? And secondly, the second thing that I noticed when I came back to Malaysia is that there seems to be a huge disparity within the Malay community. You have the NUP to so to so-called close the gap with the, with the Chinese, but do you now have a, a situation where there is a huge gap within the Malay community? Because I see a very well-educated, very intelligent um, Malays in Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, some of them don't want to come back. And at the same time, I was very shocked when I met some economic students from UM. You know, they, they couldn't express themselves very well. And if, if I were to compare them with the with the students in Indonesia, I have to say the students in Indonesia were, were much better than them. Okay. Th thanks, Amy. Uh, th thank you very much. Very rich uh, comments and questions. Any uh, more? There's uh, uh, somebody here in the front row. Cam? Hi, thank you, Cam. Um, I mean, I'm Cam, not thank you, Cam. Uh, <coughs> if, if I remember back to the 90s, and especially in English language theatre, the, the recurring themes were um, identity. Uh, every play that came on, everybody was like, you know, what am I? Am I Malay? Am I Malaysian? Am I this? Am I that? E so, that, you know, we were always like, can we just stop doing this, please? Um, so that was one, one theme that, that was uh, a constant there. The other was, um, am I mad? Um, <laughs> because uh, Mahathir, as Jahaba has pointed out, Mahathir, uh, push the idea of majoritist uh, democracy, that he'd been voted in two-thirds majority, therefore he is correct, and so therefore he is legitimate. And if you, are, if you, if you, if you think to yourself, mm, I don't quite agree with this, you must therefore be um, a minority, perhaps a minority of one, um, and therefore you might be insane. You must be insane, because everybody else disagrees with you. Um, so when the, the switch came with, I, I guess, with Anwar in, in 97 or so, the same people who earlier had all been saying, Mahathir is the best, strong leader, that's what we need. We are a great nation and successful because of who we are. Um, I think that there was a, a difficult evolution for many people to negotiate who they were and what they believed. When, when the same people who said that then now say Mahathir was a demon who destroyed this country. So there was a, a process there which I think was difficult for a lot of people. Um, question mark. Question mark. <laughs> uh, and Joe. Okay. Um, I want to come back to this idea of, um, that Michael brought up about um, Mahathir's discomfort that day. Um, and I think that for, for myself, as somebody in the arts, I don't think Mahathir's ever cared for the arts, and neither does he have any connection, real connection to it. I, th I think Tunku, in one interview, said he, that Mahathir does not care for art or sport. Right? And I think this is really important about how and the arts did or did not develop, therefore, in this country. So this, because he has no, real no love and real, real, really no connection to the word, to literature, to poetry, to these things, oh, which are other aspirational things. So being a pragmatist, the culture that therefore that was that trickled down <laughs> to the rest of us um, in Malaysia was um, was this it was was a very prag prag pragmat pragmatic, practical vision of what we were as people. And so when people were searching for their identity, these were the representations of our artistic aspirations um, that were just um, practical, as opposed to maybe something, something more spiritual, something more intangible that I think art tries to address. And I think a lot of artists therefore did not, at least in the theater, address these things, and therefore they address either like with Instant Cafe, trying to push back against this big persona, and um, 
um, or else they were trying to ask questions about, well, who are we then, really, if we're always being told in this, um, in this very paternalistic society, this is who you are and this is what you ought to be. And I think it's interesting, um, it didn't start during the Mahathir era, but certainly it didn't change, that art became something that you know, was no longer important in school. Uh, literature became a non-subject, art making, and actually art, um, visual arts became a non-subject. Theatre was completely removed. Um, and I think that if you have a prime minister who's not connected to his own culture, his own traditional culture, and doesn't appreciate it, he's not going to promote it. He's not going to think of it as being important. And that was very different to other prime ministers in the region. Um, if you go to exhibition, the exhibition at the moment in Singapore on Southeast Asian art, there are big texts from Suharto and Sukarno about what they feel about the importance of art in nation. And you don't think you'll ever find any remark by the, Dr. Mahathir um, about this. And I think that's important. Yeah. No, I just, I mean, just wanted to immediately follow up because of this debate we were having earlier about strong leadership vision and, and the, the, the converse of that, what we have now. But in many ways, the missing thing, um, and it, I think it gets to Joe's point, is that because he monopolized um, people's view of themselves because of the vision that he provided, he sucked the life out of the very institutions that should have provided the ballast in society so that these other things could flourish at the same time as reasonably efficient or powerful government. And, you know, I think of the times that I used to cover the Malaysian parliament um, as a journalist, and I would be looking at a carbon copy of the Westminster parliament, a two-bench parliament, with um, the government side and the opposition side and a speaker and a mace, and even if I remember, a wig. Um, <laughs> And I would say to myself, this is, this is a parliament. But in fact, there was no way that the opposition would actually function as an opposition. And, the, and, and hell would freeze over before a government MP would have the balls to cross from one side of the parliament to the other. So these institutions which physically exist um, had, I think, the life, as I said, sucked out of them by this very strong form of leadership um, and the ways in which power we was wielded in a very traditional sort of paternalistic way. And I think that maybe is to some extent the missing thing, um, not just in Malaysia, in, in many of the other countries, that the institutions that were established long ago um, to function in a certain way institutionally have actually deteriorated because leadership was strong, paternalistic, effective, and even if it was visionary, but the end result is that those institutions no longer function the way they should. And so, yes, it's not possible to have a balanced approach to society um, because institutions are the ones that provide the balance. Could I take a crack? Uh, it's also about authority and uh, leadership as well. I think, I think it's also important to understand the spirit of the age and, and links back to the global, global uh, you know, events. In the 1980s and 1990s, America and Europe was experiencing the, the longest economic expansion in modern time. So, from a Malaysia point of view, you have this model to look up and it works. So when it works, the spirit of the age is, you know, go for money, uh, do, do industrialization, do, do this thing, this, that. It's all materialistic and it worked. And because of that, people shifted their mind from Islam in Malaysia. But the Iranian revolution was, was failing after that. Because after the Iranian revolution, Iran was in such shambles. And you have this modern Western European US uh, model that work and then you have Islam that doesn't work. Islam is in the society, not Islam the religion, in case I get in trouble. Uh, but, 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 it only worked for so long. After the issue of financial crisis, that's, that's Malaysian Great Depression. And after that, there was signs that, you know, the so-called capitalism was failing. So they need a new model, which is dissatisfaction against the global economy. So, funnily, funnily enough, at that time, the Iraq war happened as well. So suddenly this, this, uh, this, you have this model that worked in 20 years, suddenly failing, and then you have this uh, anger about Islam in Iraq, and, and now what happened. So you could see it why, why, why Malaysia society becoming more Islamist, if you take this global development happen as well. So there's a spirit of the age. In, again, to go back to the 80s and 90s, it was, it was you know, very materialistic. And now they see that this capitalism fail, and now they're going for something spiritual. And unfortunately, um, capitalism couldn't offer that. Islam did. Islam is. Although you would, most of us don't like it, but for a lot of people, it seems to be working. 
Kathy, you were going to jump in uh, on the question of... Um just, I actually do have a quote from Art about Art, and she says essentially that, that the job of the artist is to support the agenda of the state. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, no, in fact, he, he, in, in that sense, uh, you know, there, there's a deeper issue of how we've take on, taken on uh, Western forms of governance, uh, you know, and sort of imposed it on a culture that perhaps was not ready for it, didn't have the prerequisites to really fill up those institutions. So the hollowing might not have been so much a hollowing, but it was just that it was never nurtured. We didn't have a leadership that believed that a strong and uh, a judiciary that, was, that had integrity was important, a uh, legislature that, was, that had its own mind was important, needed to balance the executive, and, and so on and so forth. Today, I mean, I think we, we're coming to the point where we can maybe make up some, make some sort of, um, some, some summations from each of the panelists. Um, where do you think this country is going? I mean, putting aside Dr. Mahathir, uh, I know he's still there. He, he's, he's a living legacy, yes, I know. And uh, I, believe, I strongly believe that he's going to be with us for a very long time. I mean, not figuratively, I mean like literally. Um, and uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, uh, but uh, where do you think uh, the wellsprings for a kind of cultural return, or where do you think our roots should be? We have a country that's very divided. Sarawak is asserting itself, Johor is asserting itself in, you know, uh, in many different ways. We have all these forces that are pulling the country in different directions. Is that a good, bad thing? We are, after all, a federation. And maybe we should just embrace the character of a federation, which is diversity, right? In a the kind of, oh, can we start with you, Jabba? What are your thoughts well, on this? Well, I want to say that uh, I thought UNESCO was going to declare Dr. Mahathir a heritage site. <laughs> Um, and that might just happen soon. Uh, but I, I think I embrace this chaos. Uh, you know, almost 60 years after Malaya got its independence, we begin to see people coming up with their own ideas what Malaya, Malaysia is, was. Um, and it's good because all this while it's been state imposed. You know, what's a Malaysian? The state imposes that. What's a Malaysian dance? The state imposes everything. You know, a, a national dance will have Malay base and have some. Chinese flourishes and some bangles and anklets from India, no one from Sabah or Sarawak. But I think what's great is that Malaysians are coming up and saying, look, I want, I want to say something about this. I want to say something about my culture. All this art that you see, I mean, I see, I see the snake and I'm thinking, hey, that's not bad representation of Dr. Mahathir. He's still there, right? Uh, but it's, everybody has their own sense of what Malaysia is. And it's, it's for the few of us to curate it and say, put some semblance into this and say, this is generally where we think it is going. We're not saying it should go there. But you can see that people are settling around some ideas and concepts. Uh, be it, I like to call it the Bangsa crowd. It used to be the Ampang crowd, uh, but now it's the Bangsa crowd, uh, the English-speaking theatre crowd, all 300 of them. Um, the great Malay five, crowd. Five, please. Right? Five? Okay. Uh, but you see, I think people are coming to grips and now they have to talk to each other. This is the thing, right? We're not talking to each other. The KL folks are not talking to the Penang folks. Uh, Penang folks are not talking to the guys across in Butterworth. So I think we need to talk to each other, and we are not. So, so, so this is the thing about Malaysians. We need to talk to each other. We don't need the state to tell us, talk to each other. We need to do it ourselves. We need to find our way. We are not free yet. We are not independent yet in that sense. We need, we need to get out of the shell of this uh, state imposed, this is what you are, you're Malay Muslim, so please don't go that way, don't, don't eat here, don't do that. I think we need to go out and find ourselves. Art is a way of, of discovering that, uh, discussions, uh, you see neighborhoods doing it. So I, you know, I like this chaos, I think chaos is good. Um, I think, for myself, uh, I have a front row seat in the world's slowest train wreck. I can't change it, but I like to see the action as it goes along. That's a slightly depressing view. <laughs> train wreck. Okay, the nation is train wreck. Uh, Michael. I thought you were going to go in order. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose that, that for me, uh, the thing that I worry about most is the abandonment of culture um, and the abandonment of the indigenous Southeast Asian cultures that constitute, and in many ways in, in Malaysia, find the most variety and diversity because you have Chinese, you have Malay, you have East Malaysia, you have Sabah, Sarawak, Borneo culture, you have uh, Indian as well, 
uh, plus all the sort of pre-modern influences that traverse the, 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 the peninsula um, that have been more or less abandoned. And, and I feel that the, the real danger is losing um, that sense of Southeast Asian identity in the quest for something, whether it's, you know, we look towards the AKP in Turkey as our model, we look towards 7th century Arabia as our model, we look towards, you know, Hong Kong, China. I mean, th these are not indigenous to this, where we are physically, geographically, um, which I think is a real shame. Hafiz. Uh, well, it, it, it's difficult to see where Malaysia can go, but, but, but essentially what I see right now is really the urban-rural divide, essentially. I mean, in rural areas, I mean, urban areas, you see people consider themselves as Malaysian. I mean, most people in here probably consider themselves Malaysian first, I suppose. But, uh, you know, the, the, the urban bubble is a bu urban bubble. If you go outside, the identity politics is becoming more complicated. You, you, are you Muslim first? Are you Malay first? Are you Chinese first? Even for Malay, the, the identity is multiple. It's, you can even say which one you first, Malay or Malay or Muslims, and people ask them whether you're Malaysian first. That's a really difficult question. There are at least three three identities working together. So, um, you know, I, I think what's going to happen, really, unless Malaysia gets an authoritarian leader, <laughs> not I, I'm, I'm aspiring for it. But if if you know Malaysia becomes more democratic more democratic in the sense of Indonesia becoming more democratic. It becoming more, you know, more localized politics, like Indonesia. Indonesia is a hyper-localized politics, like you have Sumatra and then you have Java. But for Malaysia, you have this urban-rural divide, right? And then, just, I think this is going to, you know, it's like slow train wreck. People don't see each other. I mean, there's really not much, nothing in common between the urban Malaysian and the rural Malaysian. Uh, even, even the school you go to, the people that you talk to. I mean, I have some friends from, 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 from Malacca, for instance. You're surprised I have so many Chinese friends, for instance. They, I mean, this, this idea that he is surprised, surprised me. But it's not really that uncommon. It's, it's true. We, we all live in our bubble. And it's not just that. You're talking about people talking to each other. But then again, you have to understand the language bubble. I mean, most of us here probably read the English media. I mean, I myself as a Malay don't really read Utusan. I, I don't, I think in the year, the only book, I, I'm, the only one book, one Malay book I've read so far this year. I think not just this year, in the past probably five or ten years, only one Malay book. Uh, so this is, this, is, this, is, this is an urban bubble, the language bubble, and there's a Malay bubble. I mean, the, the, the rural area, people that speak in Malay and read Malay don't really read English, mostly, and we don't really read Malay. Uh, mostly, you, you, you just, you know, if you have this democratic pressure, go, go on, go on. This thing will just manifest itself, continue and continue on. I mean, it depends what you want. If you, if you want a united country, then you would need someone like Mahade. But if you are more of a democrat, then you have to deal with this thing. Or this, 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 this uh, fracture, the fracturing society. It's really nothing, nothing, it's really nothing to hold them together. Especially, I mean, you think about, you know, having one Malaysia, for instance, that's really an elitist concept, you know, if it's cosmo cosmopolitan world, that's really an elitist concept. These are people that, you know, doing well, have good education, uh, speak English mostly. You know, I, I think it's just fracturing of society just going to go on. Kathy, um, do you think, I just want a quick question here before we, you say what you have to say, but do you think that unity is engendered by a singular vision. Is that what unity is? Is unity the fact that, can we have defined in terms of sharing a common platform and some co basic common values and trust in our institutions rather than all buying into a single slogan about where this country is going? I mean, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't really believe that you need this one overarching frame because the minute you have something like that, someone's going to get suppressed. Someone is going to, you know, by definition, having something as strong as that, you know, implies that there are going to be sections of society that are suppressed. So I, I don't personally, I'm just thinking about, I guess I'm thinking about this idea of weak states and strong societies, that, you know, um, um, which is kind of, you know, so there's a lot of 
discussion going along now about these ideas of you know weak states and strong societies and and just thinking about the arts now i think of it, yes clearly we're at this point where the state is extremely weak and as it's weak it uses much more suppressive forms to try and gain power but what it does mean also i think is what you're saying is that you know there are moments and there are, this is a moment of opportunity where you've got stronger social networks you've got stronger social groups the rise of the the kind of you know ngo invested citizen, I think is certainly true. But the problem with that is that you, it used to be constructed as a good thing, right? That you've got civil society and they're all going to be liberal and they're going to be just like us. The fact is it's not. And, you know, you've got basically, you know, the rise of the right wing, you know, right wing civil society completely using the language, using, using the methods, using the language of victimhood that the left would have used in the 60s and in the 70s. And this is not just in Malaysia, right? It's, it's everywhere, right? So, but in the arts, what I see is that there's this, this impulse towards, for example, censoring work. Work that is offensive then becomes this point where it galvanizes certain communities, you know, people are offended because it insults their ethnic identity or they, they're offended because it affects or insults or denigrates their state, you know, it goes on and on, right? So there's one, and I think that's obviously not helpful to anything. It's not helpful as artists if we're constantly having to think about who we're going to offend before we can make a work. Actually, no, you can think about who you're going to offend. That's fine. And people can be offended and they can protest. That's fine. But when you, when, you know, the, the, the language is so dangerous and so violent, then it's not a conducive atmosphere for artists. And we're in a fantastic space now. Of course, we're privileged. We're all speaking in English. We're all in a particular kind of, you know, we have a particular kind of social and cultural capital that's going to protect us. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of some of the Malay language theatre that was, uh, you know, there was a, there's Namron's work that, you know, was staged, supposed to be staged at Aswara and got shut down. You know, I mean, I think really we don't seem to understand that these things are happening, but they don't make the English newspapers, for example, one. But on the good side, I mean, you know, and I'm kind of not really in KL all the time, but I do know that there seems to be this kind of young groupings of people, young artists who are not who just are out in the street, they're doing work, they're working with activism, they're using art. I mean, Fami Reza is, is one example, obviously. You think of people like Sharon Chin as well, that's trying to kind of find a way around both being a practicing commercial artist as well as someone who's kind of looking at different streams of expression and how it interacts and intersects with people on the ground. So I think those two streams are quite interesting, right? Um, but for me, I think the biggest problem for the arts right now is not anything that we're talking about. I think it's this idea of, you know, that the arts is, is, because it's grown so much through the 1990s and because it's a global movement, you know, a moment for the creative industries, right? It's all about, you know, how much, what can art do to increase the value of this particular area in town? Or, you know, if you want government money from me, yes, fine, but can you show me that, you know, you will be able, your practice or your exhibition or your play will have these effects on, on and so on. And it's, it's, it's become accepted and it's become so accepted. That I think that, that I think is that problem. And I think it's a legacy of Mahathir's, you know, time as well, because it was opening up Malaysia to the global economy in such a way that it left us so vulnerable. Okay, there you have it. Clearly, we haven't exhausted um, the talk about Dr. Mate and his legacy, and uh, I'm sure you can, you know, speak to the, the panelists uh, even after the session. We, we have to close the session. It's uh, just after 4.30. I'd like to thank uh, Ilham for, uh, for staging this. I, I'm very disappointed that uh, the man himself didn't come. Uh, there were rumors, there, was, there were rumors, strong rumors that he would turn up. But, uh, but I just want to remind everybody that this is an art exhibition, uh, this is an art gallery, there are two levels of, uh, of exhibition, some of the new commissioned work, some of them are from, uh, from the period uh, that uh, Mahate was our Prime Minister. So please enjoy the art and, and we should keep talking about the art as well, I think, uh, beyond the, the, the simple questions of politics and power. Uh, thank you very much, um, Michael, Kathy, Hafiz and uh, Jahaba. Thank you.